happy 4th of July from your friends at the public square. Whenever you're hearing this, it might be a little bit before the 4th, might be a little after the 4th, but whenever you hear it, we want to help you celebrate. So today, we're going to talk about the first of those inalienable rights. We're going to talk about life today. I'm Alan C. Duncan, around the table with Dave Zanotti, Rob Walgate, Jeff Sanders, and Melanie Elsie. Here's Dave. Thanks, Alan. Uh, Fourth of July time. And, you know, when the fourth comes in the middle of the week, uh, then everybody has to pick a weekend. And so we probably will do two (laughs) just to make sure we we get information that covers both. Uh, We love the fourth of July because we love America's founding, because we love the promise of America and the principles upon which that promise is built. And we've often said in historical conversations, whether it's in writing or in lectures or anything we might be doing, that to truly get a read on history, you've got to go to where the characters are you're you're studying and get 100 years behind their eyes so that you can understand the world that they inherited and, in essence, the atmosphere in which they're working. Because I don't care how nobly born a person is, um, there is no one who's born with the idea of, I'm here now, and I'm here to change the world. <laughs> right? This is something we all grow up into as far as this question goes. So when you look at the birth of a nation, you've got to get at least 100 years, maybe maybe as many as 500 yeah. years yeah, no doubt. behind the founding of America uh, to really, and maybe even 1,000 they, years. They were all the products of at least 1,000 years of history from Europe and the Middle East and, and North Africa. Yeah. And I mean, there are key elements in the midst of that, the uh, the, the Ref- Protestant Reformation, the Magna Carta. I mean, there's mm-hmm. all kinds of key points that, that really impacted the history of how we got to America. So we love to do the 4th of July. We love the document. Uh, of course, we know that it was actually originally composed by five people. We always like to say that it was not the exclusive work of Thomas Jefferson. In fact, if you look at the content of the Declaration, you find it's really a a document written by John Adams with some heavy influence from his cousin, Sam. Jefferson had good handwriting, though. I will say yeah, he had great penmanship. Yes, very and good. And it's important, would, too. He was tall and redheaded and from Virginia. Yeah, yeah that's and all good. They needed a Virginian mm-hmm. to front the Declaration mm-hmm. because the colonies that were in the North that were under the most pressure from the Brits, that would certainly be Massachusetts, had been trying to build a coalition of people. And Sam Adams had been working on that for years in the committees of correspondence to help people understand that being a British subject in some states was better than being a British subject in other states. Uh, But And and we misunderstand the the time of the Declaration because we hear the theme of taxation without representation. And we tend to focus on the idea that it was about taxation. The truth of the matter is when you read the Declaration of Independence, it's a lot more about representation. They had lost a seat at the table. So there was this large uh, population of British subjects who were in British colonies who had no vote and no place. They they, they were never in the room where it happened. I think it's important to point out that the British people, whether they were in the Americas or over over in Europe, were the freest people in the world at that time. However, the British government... Uh, took back again and again, and uh, many of the rights uh, of the American colonists. Yeah, it was a back and forth game. Yeah, and the American colonists, who were British uh, subjects, said, well, that's not right. Even by your own law, you can't do that in Parliament. And the king said, well, you know, stop us. Too bad. So the Americans were not trying to overthrow a government. They were trying to get back the rights that they had once had as free people under the rule of a king and parliament. I hate to laugh, but it also makes me think of today because so many times we elect elected officials today and I see some of their attempts to take away our rights and the things they do and the decisions they make. Well, while we're laughing, uh, I, I'm, all, all I can get in my head is is little George, the puppet that we had at Christmas oh, in America yeah. several years ago when we <laughs> did the uh, George Washington year, 1783, and the rendition of, of You'll Be Back and uh, uh, What Comes Next and all of those things that they, in Hamilton that King George was actually portraying, uh, that our puppet did a great job explaining to people. But um, 
listen, before we get too far afield on baseball, hot dogs, apple pie, and American automobiles, um, and the 4th of July <laughs> celebration, let's stay with um, the words of the Declaration for a minute. Let's, let's land on those. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Now, that's the part that a lot of people focus in on, but they also focus in the beginning line, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary, necessary. for one people. It, it, dissolve it, the, the political process. bands which have bound them to another. Right. And, and, and I like the fact that they pretty quickly come to the word, a respectful view of mankind requires. In other words, they, it was a document that was basically affording respect. The idea that, look, we know this is going to seem radical because we're starting our own country and telling the mother country we're out of here. Um, and it's not going to go down easy. So we want to have an honest conversation about this. We want the world to know why we're doing what we're doing. Then they move into the real treatise. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That is such a critical reality that there was a time in our country when truths were viewed as transcendent, coming from the creator, that reality was an open universe. There was someone up there who was a person who had participated in how we got down here, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men, and of course, in, that, in the language of the day, that implied all people, women as well, and it even included people who they weren't treating equally. Yeah, men, just a shorthand for, for humans. Everyone, humans, right. yeah. All humans are created equal, and they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. This self-evident transcendent reality that we came from from somewhere, and we would ultimately end up back there and be held accountable for our time here was a self-evident truth. In other words, there was no debate. The country wasn't divided up among multiple realities. Now, it was divided up among many, many opinions. Let's not, let's not be mistaken to think that everyone was a card-carrying you know, member of a single church or a single world. No, we know that's not true. But as a as colonies represented in Congress unanimously could state, there are some things we do hold as self-evident. In other words, there's no debate left. We've, we've had all the debates. We agree. These truths are self-evident. So there's not your truth and my truth and somebody else's truth. There's, well, It's you, transcended. It's yeah, true yeah. for everybody. Yes, it and, is true truth, as and, Dr. Glover would say. Yes, and even if we shade on differences, or even if all of us in the room are not unanimous on each truth, we've basically got reality sort of defined in the same lanes with the same boundaries, and we may decide how fast you want to go or how fast you don't want to go or where that boundary should be, but we're going in the same direction. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, and that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The point of today's conversation is the first right is life. They didn't do anything in that document without intention. They didn't, you know, scratch it out and start over a whole bunch of times and say, it doesn't matter at this point. No, that was very intentional. Every word that among these our life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, it makes all the sense in the world that life would be the first right, because if you don't have your right to life protected within the communal uh, arrangement that you're living in, then you're dead. And they knew they were risking their own personal lives to do what they were doing. Right. That's why it became at the forefront. This wasn't just writing a term paper, handing it in and waiting for the grade. <laughs> I mean, lives really mattered. Yeah. And, and this, so in essence, they were stating from the beginning, this is about life and death. We know that. And it's about the individual, but you hit on something. You talked about the writing of the document consisting of more than one person. They understood the importance of the individual, but they also understood the importance of the team getting things done and people being on the same page and working together with one another because the thought of the king isn't something uh, that they were fond of. And they knew that individual liberty came from breaking away. And they knew that, there were self-evident truths. There were guardrails, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just power from the consent of the governed. They also knew that the government was not the ultimate arbiter, but that people would be in the process and we would have to govern based upon consent. Now, what makes America so unusual is that we govern based upon consent, but we don't wipe out the people who disagree. 
everything in the way our government was formed, framed, practiced, and developed in the founding era had put placed an equal value upon the minority opinion as the majority opinion. Because the value was not placed on your opinion, the value was placed upon your origin, your design, that you are a part of the creator's work. Therefore, even if we disagreed, your right has to be respected. And even if you're in a minority position, we can't squash the minority. We have to set up a process where if you lose today on the vote, you feel that you can come back tomorrow and fight it over again. It may take you a year. It may take you five years. May take, I mean, how many years did it take Wilberforce to prevail on the question of slavery? 50. Yeah. And how many years was John Quincy Adams till the very last breath he took in the Capitol fighting against slavery in America? To the end of his life, the president, now congressman, fought to the very end. It, he was in a minority position. His position ultimately prevailed. That they, so that was a critical part of the nature of our form of civil government is protection for the rights of the minority. Because just because we disagreed or I had more votes than you doesn't make me more important than you. It's, it's basically sometimes, you know, everyone's ever been raised in a family knows that there's differences of opinion. And sooner or later, sometimes you got to go with where everybody's going. Just because you're one guy saying something doesn't mean that you're wrong. Nobody has the right to squash you. I mean, think about right. uh, Galileo. He was the only guy in the world at the time. Uh, the, whole, the, the only guy saying that the earth revolves around the sun. He was kind of squashed for a while. Turns out he was he was right, right? Well, and just because you're only one guy doesn't mean you have the right to stop the process That's if right. it's going forward. So this is this the structures of how we began. So the first right, the first right is life. And we want to talk about that this July 4th time period because there is a crisis in our nation. We're about a year past Roe versus Wade falling in the Dobbs decision. Great strides have been made in many states. But the battle now is being framed in a number of states that's going to depend upon ballot issues in this year, immediately, imminently, right now, and in the year to come. We need to do something to help people understand what's going on and where the critical points of that battle are. All right. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, team. We'll get right into that when we come back after this short break on the public square. Please stay with us. Well, thanks for sticking with us today on the public square. I just wanted to issue a brief warning as we get into this next segment. We are talking about some bad ballot language, and this is going to lead us into some conversations that we're going to have to use some words and some terms that you might not want to talk about with your small children. So just be aware of that as we proceed forward if you're listening with small kids. Nothing too crazy or extreme, but we are talking about some, some pretty important, some pretty heavy issues. I just want to give you a warning. All right, and here's Dave and the rest of the team. So there are ballot issues going on in many states across the country. Rob, I want to get a report on what's going on for 24 in the presidential election, then, tw then this year, 23. Yeah, in 24, the presidential election year, there are two right now we know that will be on the ballot as it pertains to the issue of abortion, the states of New York and Maryland. We've talked about the New York We've proposal. That's the, really a creepy one. Yes, that came from their legislature. It's left a lot of people scratching their head. And as we get deeper uh, into 2024, I'm sure it'll be talked about a lot. And, and there are other states in the pipeline as well. There, there are some states pending in 2023. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, even 2024, you've got Nevada, New, uh, Oregon, South Dakota, Missouri. Yeah, there are more that could be certified right. and happen. And in 2023, it looks, by all accounts, that there will be a vote in November when it comes to the issue of, of 2023 this year. 2023. Mm -hmm. um, the, the signature gatherers, Planned Parenthood, many on the left have been out for months gathering signatures. 
and um, they claim to have enough to be valid and to make the ballot to be on the 2023 November ballot in Ohio. So right now there is a proposal in the Midwest, right in the heart of the country. Now, Ohio is uh, in recent elections, you go back quite a good number of years, Ohio has been moved into the red category on the blue-red game. Uh, and it certainly is not viewed any longer as a swing state. And I will tell you that Ohio, for a long time, has been viewed as a pro-life state in a major statewide election. In a general election year where everybody shows up, the consultants believe that in the state of Ohio, there's about a 4 to 5% swing for a candidate who is pro-life. So there is a pro-life bump, a margin in Ohio elections. So this should be a snap, right? 2023, <laughs> no, get it out a, there and, and go? It, it's not going to be a snap. I mean, a lot of folks talk about Ohio being, and I'm using air quotes, obviously, a red state. And I always say, well, Sherrod Brown is one of 100 votes in the United States Senate. He is from the state of Ohio, and he is one of the most liberal voices and votes in the United yeah, States Yeah, it's a big Senate. deal, isn't it? It, it is. Yeah. So um, is it going to be a snap in 2023 for Ohio to defeat an abortion amendment? It's going to be a lot of hard work. So let's take a look. We want to take some time to see how that amendment actually applies to the question of life, right? Life is Wait. the first right. Life is the first right enunciated in the Declaration of Independence. It is, and I feel like all eyes across the country will be on the state of Ohio because they do view this as a battleground and say, well, if Planned Parenthood, um, the abortion industry is saying, if we can get this done in Ohio, imagine all the other states we can get this or even worse language put into a constitution. Yeah, if we're going to look at the scoreboard, after a year, about 20 states or a few more have actually pretty much secured a strong pro-life position in their laws in the state. And those things have come quickly and are pretty solid. So about half the nation is still up for debate. There's a number of other states, I think, I'm not exactly sure the number, I think it's trending toward a dozen to 16 that are seemingly moving more in the pro-abortion direction. So a big ballot fight in Ohio in 2023 uh, where it, they've got sole attention center stage because there's no other ballot issue out there. That's going to actually be the number one report on what happens in the 2023 election. That will be the story. So we better get out on it right now here on the public square. And you say, well, wait a minute, there's a little bit, that's a little too close for me because isn't that where your national headquarters is? Yeah, we happen to be all together in studio today. Most of the times we're spread out all over the country, but we're here. And that being the case, we're sitting in Valley City, Ohio right now. So does this sound a little self-serving? You're calling up for help for the home team? Uh, yeah. And here's why. All hands on deck. If this is an all hands on deck situation. Um, the entire abortion community and all their billions of dollars are being directed at one Midwestern state right now. If they can take Ohio with a ballot initiative, they will use that leverage to catapult against every pro-life initiative that's out there and in favor of every pro-abortion initiative out there. What happens right now will bear serious consequences over the next several years. And now we're going to be at this fight for life for the rest of our lives. Like we were fighting against Roe for 50 years. We'll be fighting for another 50 years to truly protect life across this country. But some of these early battles are going to make a tremendous difference. And if Ohio suddenly becomes the state that, that turned one year post-Dobbs, Ohio is now pro-abortion, that's going to send a message across the country that is massive. Now you say, well, is this an ego fight? No, it's not an ego fight. It's a fight for the lives of unborn children. And some people would say, well, we've seen this happen in other states, and they most notably point to Kansas. And I think it's a totally different scenario yeah. from what happened in the K Kansas during their vote compared to what's being attempted in the state of Ohio as it pertains to a constitutional amendment. Yeah, so let's get into the amendment. We've got an amendment that's been drafted, and they've circulated petitions for it, which, which is what the law requires. And now they're in a position where they're ready to go to the ballot. So what's it say? Um, uh, the first part of it is the most amazing part. Melly, I'm going to let you read just the opening couple of sentences. Just, just Now, understand, this is a constitutional language. So the state of Ohio's constitution in the annotated version that's got all the precedent stuff in it, it's about uh, two inches thick, inch and a half, two inches thick. If you just take the words of the constitution, not all the legal mumbo jumbo in regards to precedents and suits, it's it's less than a half inch thick. It's it's not a huge document. It has a number of sections and provisions. Starts with a Bill of Rights that reminds us that all authorities in the hands of the people. 
Now, remember that abortion is an industry. It's not just an experience that happens to people. It is an industry. And so we have a situation where the abortion industry is seeking to place its business in the Constitution to give it a super standing where they have, all, all, you know, like, for example, the, the U.S. Copyright Office is, is established in copyright law from the Constitution that goes back to 1787. If you're dealing at USPTO, all right, you're dealing with an organization that's been around since 1787. They're in the Constitution. You say, well, people talk about the media, freedom of the press. It's, it's, we don't, we're the only group of people in the, in the federal Constitution that have our business in constitutional language, in the First Amendment. Well, kind of, sort of. USPTO was there before you were. But okay, so yeah, that's true. Well, now we're talking about a similar situation where in Ohio, the abortion industry would have their own segment written by their people in the state constitution. The only other business in Ohio that has got that kind of a sweetheart deal is the casino industry. Is there a relation? Uh, well, I know they seem to be hanging out a lot at the same yeah, places. Yeah, hang but, out a lot. Yep. Okay, uh, at the state house at least. So give us the language, Melanie. This would be amended into Article 1, Section 22. Every individual has a right to make and carry out one's own reproductive decisions, including but not limited to decisions on contraception, fertility treatment, continuing one's own pregnancy, miscarriage, care, and abortion. The state shall not directly or indirectly burden, penalize, prohibit, interfere with, or discriminate against either the individual's voluntary exercise of the right or the person or entity that assists an individual exercising this right. Now, Article 1 is the Bill of Rights. So they're right. putting this in the Ohio Bill of Rights section of the Constitution. Let's just go with that first part of that first sentence again. Every individual. Okay, every individual. You notice this is a woman. Not woman. Does not, it have an age there? So no age, no, no age. gender. So, so no a 10-year-old can qualify. A 13-year-old can any qualify. Any individual qualifies. Okay. okay. Any, okay. any breathing sure. individual. Okay. Go, for, go on from there. Has a right to make and carry out one's own reproductive decisions. So if you're talking about minor children, there is no parental involvement. So surely reproductive decisions is defined by this language, right? Reproductive decisions is not defined. Um, Nor is individual. Individual is not de defined. Let's stop. Let's just go right with those two. Reproductive decisions. Has, has anyone ever seen that language? I, I've never seen that it's language in, in law before. It's a special edition of the Ohio State Constitution somewhere, right? No. <laughs> no. I'm being... No. no. Uh, sarcasm no. is my no. love language. Well, it, and it's, it's, it, so. it, the, the definition... Of a law. Now, this is where you get into the difference between correct legal construction and incorrect construction. You also get into the idea of where, do you, where you're trying to put something that is so behavior driven, you tend not to put it in the Constitution. You tend to put it in the, the statutes of the state because you, you have a lot of room for definitions and circumstances, and it can be amended and changed when circumstances change. Here you've got a situation where there's, again, you got to read it again, the first part. Every individual has a right to make and carry out one's own reproductive decisions. The problem is not only do they not define reproductive decisions, because there's a list of five things, and someone could say, well, that's the definition. But it says, but, it but says, not limited to. It says, but not limited to decisions on. So it can be anything beyond these. <laughs> and so even it's these, these, but, but, but even the five items more. aren't defined. It's these, but it could be many more. Well, we've talked a lot about, well, on the broadcast the past several weeks, about being short-sighted. When we, when we create, it, would this be another example then of being short-sighted and not looking beyond the language? Okay, that's a, a wonderful question. Whether it's short-sighted or long-sighted, ah, it okay. may be yeah. very intentional okay. to be so vague. Left intentionally vague, yep, okay. It needs to be, from their perspective, it needs to be vague intentionally so that as our culture evolves, or devolves. everything or yeah, devolves. that comes down the pike becomes a part of this constitutional right. We could spend a couple of days talking about what do you think reproductive decisions mean? But, but the fact of the matter is, we don't know. Right. Well, I think it's important to say most, most, if, if someone's just thinking a woman deciding 
that she wants to carry her baby to, you know, to term. Right. That, no, that sounds all very nice and innocuous. So we have to make clear that this means Anything, anything and anyone of any age. So what we want to do is, is we got to run to a break, but we're going to come back and we're going to actually take that subject forward and say, okay, let's, based on the language of the premise of this, we'll give them their due on what they're saying it does apply to, but not limited to. And then we'll get into the question of, okay, but what about this? of liberty across the land. Now back to the public square. Back around the table with the team at the public square, I'm Alan C. Duncan with Dave Zanotti, Rob Walgate, Jeff Sanders, and Melanie Elsie. We're talking about some really bad ballot language today that you almost have to hear to believe. Uh, So Rob, why don't you get into that for us? When I read this language, I'm having flashbacks to Lawrence v. Texas. 2003. 2003, mm-hmm. the year I started with the American Policy Roundtable. And I remember it was my first foray into reading Supreme Court decisions. U.S. Supreme Court decision. It was my first time looking at it, you teaching me to read from the back to the front, all these other things I remember. Finding but, out that Melanie always knows more than the rest of us yeah, usually but, combined. Yeah, yeah, she's always <laughs> I, right. I remember you connecting the dots and explaining us, talking about the Kennedy Doctrine, taking a look at Scalia's writings, telling us where this could lead us. And I remember, so at that time, I was obviously 20 years younger, much younger, and thinking to myself, boy, that sounds like a bridge too far. I'm not sure that can happen in You're that way. You're way out there, Dave. Yeah, I, I did. I was just like, oh, man, I don't know if I can go there thinking in my in my mind that we could get to that place. And here we are 20 years later, and we're beyond everything yeah. you even touched on to think that, June is the way it is now to think about sports and, and transgender, just to think about everything you talked about. You you talked about things I couldn't imagine, and I don't think you got close to where we've actually went. If they if someone had predicted what where we are right now, Scalia did. Years ago, Sc- well, Scalia, Scalia did. And about nobody believes him. <laughs> with specifics about, about the men participating in women's sports, men being in women's locker rooms and that sort of thing. If you said that 10, 15 years ago, you would have been laughed out of the room. They and said, that will that would never happen. And Scalia and, and was laughed out of the room. Can I just read a brief line from mm-hmm. Scalia's dissent sure. on Lawrence v. Texas? He says, he said in 2003, state laws against bigamy, same-sex marriage, adult incest, prostitution, masturbation, adultery, fornication, bestiality, and obscenity are likewise sustainable only in light of Bauer's validations of laws based on moral choices. Every single one of these laws is called into question by today's decision. Now, we're not talking about this being the overturning of marriage. This was the first case. This was the domino one. This is domino Mm -hmm. one in 2003, 20 years ago, and all the dominoes are falling. So, Rob, you're saying Dave was too calm about this in 2003? (laughs) No, I'm saying he probably was perfect because, you know, I I just think, I know I always make reference to Doc Brown and the DeLorean. If he would have pulled up in 03 and said, I'm going to take you to 2023, Mm -hmm. I want you to see what you're facing, I'd have got out of the DeLorean and said, there's no way. So I'm, we're saying, or at least I think, the not limited to, in the phrase that's pending in Ohio, can lend, can lead to hamstringing our state legislature in having laws against prostitution, for example. This is, but now let's, let's put this in construction, is when you're talking about adding something to the Bill of Rights, you're making the provisions of these, this portion of, uh, you're making these civil rights. You're, you're moving them into the realm. Now we say constitutional rights. The Constitution doesn't create rights. It might only enumerate rights that the framers and the declaration said have been given to us by God. Okay, so this is the idea. They knew they weren't creating rights. They were quantifying and enumerating the rights that the people already had. In this instance, they are creating a new category of human experience, calling it as a part of the Bill of Rights, and it's called reproductive decisions. 
but they do not define what that is. Is. And it's not even about, we're not even talking about adults because it doesn't say that. Right. Exactly. So you talked about prostitution, Melanie. This could allow for child prostitution. Child what, or, or, is it, or, or what if the child wants to prostitute themselves? We're talking about 13 year olds. You could be talking about consensual And they, and they want to do this for profit, you cannot contracted. Out, you cannot allow it. What if a 13 year old yeah. says, That would be I defined wanna, as a reproductive okay, decision. What if a 13 year old says, I want to get a vasectomy? What if a 13 year old says, I want to get my tubes tied? You can't stop that. Right, because it's a reproductive decision. That's right. And they would have that right in the Bill of Rights. Well, and again, there are going to be people who are hearing this that says, that's insane. You're crazy. Don't say crazy things on the radio. Let me take you back to 2003. Yes. Uh, And look at what's happening in the transgender movement right now, mm -hmm. where where these things are occurring, but they're occurring a lot of times in secret. Uh, And parents aren't able to, to know what's happening at these schools. Uh, this would enable this to happen in the full light of day and you couldn't stop it legally. Okay, that's a huge point. And for those of you that say, stop saying crazy things on the radio, may I humbly submit, I wish we were crazy. I wish Mm -hmm. we were wrong. So sad. I would trade being wrong. You could have the radio show. Take it, take it off the air. Take it off the air if we're wrong. But you know, there's a problem. I got the document right in front of me. It's right here in plain English. It's on the ballot in the state of Ohio. People are going to go and vote for it. And when you put a piece of document in your constitution without specific definitions, who do you think is going to define what it means? The courts are going to define what it means. And are the courts going to suddenly have someone come and say, we want less freedom, we want less liberty, and we want you to rule on this to take away more of our decisions? No. The the people that are going to say, hey, this is new. This is consensual. I want to do this. This is my rights. This is my reproductive freedom. How's the court going to say no? It's in the Constitution. How can they forbid things like child pornography anymore? Because Because it could be a reproductive decision. decision. Mm-hmm. Well, and this is the problem when you accept the progressive worldview. When you accept the progressive worldview, there's there's no guardrails anymore. There's nothing too far to the left. There's no absolute moral truth well, I, anywhere. Sure. Well, I'm just saying there's nothing too far left. You're saying I like you're saying I want more rights. I want more this, more, more, more. There's no stopping. Uh, Melanie, again, forgive me. Read the read that language again. Every individual has a right to make and carry out one's own reproductive decisions, including but not limited to decisions on contraception, fertility treatment, continuing one's own pregnancy, miscarriage, care, and abortion. And the operative cause was but not limited to. Right. Right? So reproductive decisions, including but not limited to. In other words, they're telling you there's a full recognition that there are many other reproductive decisions that people can make. Besides these. Besides these. So you can't stop those, even though we won't name what they are. If you could convince someone that that's what that is, good for you. You got it. And we don't know who wrote, who exactly wrote this language. Right. Should there be a requirement that when language is submitted for constitutional amendment sake, there should be an author with it. Like, Wouldn't that be like, hey, quaint? This is this is who wrote this. Yeah, these Just are the people so that you contributed. Know, yeah, yeah, these are these are some of the folks that, or these are all of the folks that contributed to it. And then you would know. I mean, that was always one of the big questions. You know, we've seen other constitutional amendments. We know they were written by lawyers from out of state who didn't understand tax law. We Ohio. have written constitutional amendments. I would be happy to have full disclosure that our name was associated with them. We've never disavowed them. We told everybody what we wrote. Well, I'm just reminded of one. It seemed like a lawyer from Michigan wrote something that they where they didn't understand Ohio tax law, and it created Oops. an absolute mess I, when it came to implementation. Let's keep going. I, you, you're hot on the language. Go. I think equally important is this paragraph B. The state shall not directly or indirectly burden, penalize, prohibit, interfere with, or discriminate against either the individual's voluntary exercise of this right or a person or entity that assists the individual exercising this right. Mm. This is where they're building their business plan into the the organizations that assist on all of these different facets of um, reproductive anything. Reproductive decisions. And and you can't, wow, wait a minute. 
feel like I'm getting a sense of who wrote this language. Or, I don't know. Or <laughs> Call me crazy. How about but, an entity that assists with? That's what I saw. So all these other, I don't know, the porn industry, the sex trafficking industry, they're all loving this, right? You can't stop them legally right. if this passes. If what they're doing is considered in a court of law, because it's not defined here, they, that means they have the right to claim it. It's a right. Mm -hmm. They have the right to claim it. They have the right to do it. You don't have the right to arrest them or try to stop them. And if you do, they have the right in a court of law to prove that their right supersedes anything else that's in statute. And guess what? The Constitution prevails over statutory language. So you're going to have to get a judge to come up with some ruling from the bench. A penumbra. Yeah, that says you're not allowed to do that because, well, it's always been illegal. Well, that's why we passed the amendment, because it ain't illegal no more. This would also cover transgender surgery. So if you want to take a, a, a minor and, and take the boy, little boy and turn him into a little girl, you cannot stop Big Pharma from pumping them full of experimental drugs. You cannot stop the hospital from doing this surgery. You can't stop any of it. You have no control. Well, that's terrifying, but we're not giving up. Talking about some very bad ballot language today. First step is knowing that it exists. Second step is stopping it. So we're going to continue to talk about this when we come back for more on The Public Square. Please stay with us. of liberty across the land. Now back to the public square. You are listening to the public square. We're talking about some bad ballot language, some sneaky ballot language that's trying to cut against that first inalienable right, the God-given right to life. Uh, Melanie, you had a few more points to make about this. They have some n nonsense statements in here as well that try to make the person reading this think, oh, there are restrictions, but when reality there are not. So for example, the state would have to, de to, to put restrictions on these rights. The state would have to demonstrate it as using least restrictive means to advance the individual's health in accordance with widely accepted and evidence-based standards of care. Well, widely accepted could be if other states are doing it, that would be construed as widely accepted. They also say that the the abortion the abortion could be prohibited after fetal viability if the abortionist the but treating, it says it may be not it will so, be or it shall be but it says shall not in any case may such an abortion be prohibited if the patient's treating physician that would be the abortionist mm -hmm. determined that it was necessary to protect the patient's health mental health so that you have the abortionist determining if the abortion is necessary. Economic so, health. so these are always words. These exactly. are words that are set up to make you think you're hearing a restriction, but in fact, it's you're not. hearing a loophole big enough to drive a semi-tractor trailer truck through what, what is by design. What is evidence-based standards of care? Does that yeah. mean oh, 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 I'm, sure it's, I'm sure it's defined right oh, well, there. Isn't sure, it, does that yeah. mean a study done by a professor? I don't know, brother, but it's in your every, constitution every now. Every study is bought and paid for by somebody else. You well, can you manipulate have, any charts and graphs you want. You even or, have journal, medical journals now that are talking about how it's important to allow money minors to have these surgeries for, for um, identity changes, mm -hmm. that would be probably brought into the courtroom well, of as, course, an, it's a as a standard of based yeah. um, evidence. And, and pump them full of experimental drugs for which we do not have any long-term studies. There you go for studies that shows the long-term side effects of any right. of these so things. Th there is, it, this language has zero uh, definitive protections for women and children, period. And yeah, it doesn't sense. even recognize that women or children exist. It never uses the word woman. It never uses the word ch child or minor. Let's, but they do have some definitions. Let's listen to the definition of fetal viability because it may be, but not shall be, that fetal viability would be a question about the permissibility of abortion. Fetal viability means, now again, this proves that they know you're supposed to define things. Mm. 
Therefore, the things they chose not to define, they did a, that was a choice. So here's a choice where they made to define. Feet of viability means the point in a pregnancy when in the professional judgment of the pregnant patient's treating physician, the fetus has a significant likelihood of survival outside the uterus with reasonable measures. Wait a second. None I'm tracking with you until you get to with reason. Well, what wait a minute. Mean? What does that mean? And no. what's the definition of reasonable? Right. I mean, if you're in this kind of a situation, there are things that are medically in the realm of extreme concerns. You have life and death issues going on here. What's reasonable? Well, the determination of reasonable is made by the attending abortionist. Oh. So there you go, out the window. So reasonable could be convenient. It's open season on the child mm -hmm. in the Up womb. Up yes. through the yeah. ninth what? month. Viability means... Up through the ninth month. Month. Yeah. See Kermit Gosnell. Yeah. yeah. Vi right. Viability means the ability to live within your natural environment. What is the natural environment for a child before it's born? There you go. The womb, right? right. What's your natural environment, Melanie? Uh, breathing air, right? Mm -hmm. What if I stick you 20 feet under the water? That's not your natural environment, is it? You're going to die. Well, you take a child out of the womb and, and by chemical extraction or force, whatever else. You take it out of its natural environment without any attending medical community, it's going to die. They're saying it's okay to take and it out of its now, natural environment. The reason and let that it die. that is very important, Jeff, is that this language has nothing in it to stop live birth abortion. There's nothing. To like stop. partial birth abortion. Uh, no, even if even, even, even a failed live, abortion, even a, fa even a nine month a old baby. child on the table, yeah. fully sustainable. And I say, oh, I don't want it now. It's fully sustainable. There's they nothing. Let it die. And this is that's why when Alan talks about welcome back to Kermit Gosnell, we're talking about a situation with activity that is currently criminal. It's considered murder or manslaughter. Would be viable. Constitutionally considered a right. They'd be carrying out their own reproductive decision, correct? That's I mean, exactly that, right. How about this one? I've yet heard this one discussed other than in our staff. I'm sure other people will catch on quickly on this. But someone's saying to the radio right now, cloning. Exactly. Ooh. Where is there more a, a more one-to-one -one mini me relationship with someone deciding on my reproductive decisions? I'd like another me, please. Okay, <laughs> there it is. You've got all right, like, like another you, please. I want a twin. All right. Yeah. So now we've got a situation where that's a reproductive decision, clearly, as clear as can be. All right. What about fetal tissue harvesting? Well, that's already being done. Right. That's been but, done for years. Like Alan said, it's been done in secret and it's illegal. Now it would be a reproductive decision. So, I mean, as horrible as this sounds, what about if a person decided that, well, I can't even, I can't even speak about it. I can't even speak about it. Did they write this language? Are they being like, maybe I was as a 16, 17 year old. I wanted to stay out till one in the morning. So I knew I better ask to stay out till three in the morning and we'll negotiate down from there. Are they coming up with their first attempt to be so outrageous, so bad that they're going to come back and say, all right, we knew that was bad, but take a look at this. Let's it's not reasonable. near as bad. If yeah, the voters, right. in fact, reject it. Yes. But here's the thing. How many people read this? Right now, not only, how, that's right, Jeff, not only how many people are going to read it, but they're putting this up in a November election in an off-off election year, which is one of the lowest turnout scenarios in the state of Ohio. So if they get all of their troops out... yeah. Right, and vote, and other people aren't even aware well, that there's an election going on, then this becomes not just a lo the law of the land, not just the Constitution, but a part of the Bill of Rights. And we know that language that is just as bad as this is going on the ballot in New York in 2024. Yes. And that, was, yeah, and that proposal that was may there, even be worse. That yeah. was put there by lawmakers. Yeah. That wasn't put there by the people gathering signatures or Planned Parenthood or the abortion industry. They just worked with the lawmakers. Yeah, and this is not right. Ohioans going out gathering signatures. No. This is the pro-abortion industry going out and telling all kinds of fanciful tales to people about, you want to protect, protect, uh, protect reproductive freedoms, right? The first time you ever see the word, how is it, reproductive decisions, mm -hmm. is when you see the ballot language in front of you. Everything else is about right to an abortion, reproductive freedom, women's rights. The whole campaign is about this language over here, but the whole reality is about the language that's on the paper that will be in the courtrooms, and they're not the same thing. 
just as a just as a fun exercise, I typed in reproductive decision into a search engine just to see what would pop up. Just now. Just now. And the first link that pops up is from the National Institutes of Health. Ooh. .gov. I don't know. That's just the first thing that pops up. So who knows? So we're in a situation where <laughs> this is where the trend is going. The Ohio constitutional amendment right now on the ballot in the voting starts in a number of weeks mm -hmm. is right now. And that leads to the New York amendment. Can you imagine if this passes in Ohio, the leverage they'll have in New York? Can you imagine as they go to state by state by state? No. Now, and it won't just stay in, in regards to constitutional amendments. It'll go to everything. So we've got to talk about what do we do? What do we do? And how can people around the country help? Because this is not exclusively a Midwest battle, nor a single state battle. This is the battle for life from sea to shining sea. And that's why we're talking about it in the context of the Declaration of Independence, because it's life is the first right. Yes, it is. Thanks, Dave. Uh, we're going into our final break. Some stations might have to cut away now. If your station does, you can find us at thepublicsquare.com. You can find us on the free Public Square mobile app. Just look for the lamppost there. But for everybody else, we'll be back shortly. So please stay with us for more of the Public Square. We will be right back for more on the Public Square. talking about our first God-given right on this 4th of July edition of the Public Square. Life is the first right. What do we do about this? First thing is we must understand, just like the framers of the Declaration of Independence understood, they had different regions among the 13 colonies, but they all had to strike as one clock. They had to have 13 clocks all strike at the same time ringing at the same time. They had to galvanize together against a force that was much greater than them to be able to make their case for liberty. We have to work together as a nation, state by state, campaign by campaign, candidate by candidate, because we are all in this together. What happens in one state impacts every state. So first thing we've got to do is please everywhere, California, New York, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, Florida, Tennessee, North, South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, everywhere, all along the East Coast, please, please pray for the state of Ohio. Pray for the people of Ohio. Pray that God will deliver them from this horrifically ridiculous piece of constitutional, well, let's call it a proposal. I could use a lot of other names. Now, I'm going to say one more thing that might come as a surprise to some people. It doesn't matter whether you're pro-life or pro-abortion. This is terrible legal construction. This is an endless fiasco of mystery and manipulation that's coming. Quote me, I said an endless fiasco of mystery and manipulation. Put it, put it on the TV commercials. Put it anywhere you want to put it. This is just plain horrible work. It's so poorly written. We're going to sit around and wait for people in black robes to tell us what Once it means. Once again, we'll be right Boy. back where we were. It'll be endless. And if you inject in here just this one phrase, the state shall not prohibit or interfere with an entity that assists individuals exercising this right. That is goodbye any policy that keeps Planned Parenthood out of the schools. Or any recruiters or anyone right. that's doing anything regarding what did we call it? Reproductive decisions. That right. means if you've got people coming in to your school doing all kinds of program curriculum that has to do with something considered in, in regards to human sexuality, because sexuality Man, and reproduction are, are kind of linked pedophiles, together. The, I mean, the drag queen. You name it. Who, who you cannot stop them. Who you will not try. be able to. But the thing is, they can try, and then you've got to try to stop them because now they've got the power of the Bill of Rights behind them. And let's talk about the title of the proposal. The right to reproductive freedom with protections for health and safety. Where are the protections? Where, where are they? <laughs> Zero. That's the title. Yeah. So it's misleading from the rip. Yep. I, I would like to speak 
directly to any pastors who are listening right now. I was a pastor for 31 years. It is completely legal for you from the pulpit on Sunday morning or Saturday morning, whoever you happen to be, whatever church, to say, folks, this ballot initiative is horrendous, and I am imploring you as people of faith to vote it down. And here's what will happen if it passes. Here's what can happen if it passes. You can hand out the literal document of the language in every bulletin. You can put it up on your screen. Let people look at it with their own eyes. You are not endorsing a candidate. You cannot endorse no. a candidate from the pulpit. You cannot do that. You can but do it this, personally. You can't do it organizationally. This is about an issue, and you can speak from it. And if you don't, and if you are silent, we can stop this right now. But I believe that God is, is speaking to you to speak from the pulpit to encourage your people to get up and vote down this horrendous evil before it becomes law. And let me speak to the state of Ohio, because if every pastor did exactly what Jeff would said, we'd still lose. Because there's not enough people in church to defeat this. Very true which means that you've got to then get out of that pulpit. You've got to get out of those four walls and you've got to come up with a reasonable way to explain to your neighbors that regardless of whether they're pro-life or pro-abortion, this is a very bad language bill to put in your constitution. This is how you love your neighbor. It, this, is, this is bad for everybody. It, this is really bad work. It should be rejected just because it's so crazy in regards to legal construction and the mayhem that it will create across the board, and it offers zero protection to children unborn or born. They can be manipulated in this process. We repeatedly say on the public square that words matter, especially in the application of law. And when you're talking about changing the Constitution, I echo those same thoughts. It is so vitally important that language only goes in there. Right. That is going to be good policy and benefit all Ohioans. This is not that. It, it, in fact, I can go for, so far as to say that we have a 43-year history at the American Policy Roundtable of working on constitutional measures, writing constitutional amendments, deconstructing others, uh, uh, litigating for, litigating against, doing ballot campaigns. We've been doing this for 43 years. I can tell you with absolute certainty, this is the worst piece of legal construction. And I would tell you right now, we have debated behind closed doors with pro-abortionists. We debated Roe versus Wade with some of the finest legal minds behind closed doors. They would never do it in public. We said, fine, we'll do it privately. Test us. See where we've never lost the debate on the question of Roe with a pro-abortion lawyer, with experts. Never. Lost. They all conceded. They gave up. They basically said, uncle. Now, they were willing to do that because... No one else was listening. And they said it was a horrible decision. It never should have been done. Those same people, I guarantee you, would say this is horrible behind closed doors, but for their politics, but for their politics. So it's not even close to honest. It doesn't merit support, even if you're pro-abortion. It's embarrassing. Folks that are running for election or have talked about running for election in each respective state, should people, our listeners, be asking them where they would stand on a proposal such as this oh, sure. in that's their a, state? That's a great way. You can use this as a tool. We, we're putting this up. If, we're put, if, you, if you don't get our monthly update, may I encourage you to get the July monthly update from the American Policy Roundtable. It's free of charge. We're literally printing this out. We're showing you our notes on it. We're literally marking the thing up so you can look at what we're looking at and the conversations we're having. We're asking these questions again in print and writing. So first thing, of course, is pray for Ohio. Pray for Ohio. Secondly, anybody you know in Ohio, anybody you know that knows people in Ohio, anybody that does business in Ohio, that has friends, allies, church friends, memories in Ohio, please talk to somebody. Send them this broadcast. You can get it at thepublicsquare.com. You can get it on our phone app. Send them this piece. Now, there are going to be some people who are going to kind of Listened yawning. Sometimes we're on very early in the morning in different places, and they're going to go, wow, you guys were really intense about that. Could you lighten up a little bit? I had somebody write the other day said, you sounded like a, <laughs> like a human fire alarm. Yeah. yeah. You should about there some certain things. There are some things, things yeah. in life that you have to be all in or get out. And when it comes to the protection of innocent human life, 
particularly as it regards to the Constitution and the Bill of Rights in state constitutions. This is a matter of life and death. People will die based upon this. Children will die. Innocent children will die. This is bad. This is a bad, bad idea. So, if you're planning on spending any money in the pro-life world between now and the end of this year, may I encourage you to find organizations in Ohio and send some of it to them because everybody's going to need all the help they can get. You mean if I live in California, I can send a check to somebody in Ohio? Yeah, I can do that. You huh? can do that. How about that? All right. That? And, 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 if, and if you choose, you want to support us as we take this out to the field because we're going to be fighting this with everything we've got, we'd be grateful. There are other people that are fighting it as well. Right. All right. Pray for the pastors. Amen. Pray for all the pastors. Pray for, please. Pray for the rabbis in the synagogues. Amen. Pray for the pastors. Pray for the priests. Pray for everyone. And pray that this message gets out, that God would permit this message to get out and the people would rise up. And remember, it's a non-major election year. It's not a general election year. People don't usually vote in the off-off election year. We need people to go vote for life. Amen. Thanks, Dave. You've been listening to The Public Square. For more information, visit us at thepublicsquare.com. We'll see you next time. The Public Square is a broadcast service of the American Policy Roundtable. 